Hey everyone, Clay Blair. I hope you guys are doing great. I hope you're enjoying the footage from the Let It Be recording class that we did for Pro Mix Academy. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, click on the Produce Like a Pro uh, YouTube and find it. It's pretty recent. What we're going to do today is I'm just going to show you some of my favorite plugins. Some of them are Beatles related, some are not, but most all of them I use all the time. I want to start with one of the most iconic uh, pieces of gear, the, the period in the recording world, and that's the Fairchild. Having used real Fairchilds, the best sounding, most authentic that I've found is the, uh, the UAD 670 and 660. This is a 660 because I have uh, a mono drum signal. And if you were doing a more Beatles type of uh, mixing, then you would definitely be using a 660. They didn't use 670s. In fact, I'm not even sure if they had one. I think they had mostly 660s. So same thing, just stereo. I'm going to play back a, a drum loop and I'm going to bypass it and tell you guys kind of what's going on here. And you'll immediately hear the difference. What I might do actually is leave it on first because I think it's going to sound to your ears, it's going to sound more like recordings you might know, and then take it off just to let you hear how really different it is. This is not bypassed. This is everything in. Uh, here we go. The kick is really pillowy and it kind of punches through like, like it's fighting to get out. Same with the snare. They kind of, everything that goes between them, they, they kind of turn into this pillowy punch, which is kind of really what a Fairchild does to uh, harder transients like drums or bass or, you know, a really aggressive acoustic guitar, or piano, anything really you put in front of it. I'm just going to now solo the drums with the Fairchild, the 660 by UAD. You can't beat it. I've tried every one of the other Fairchild's out there, Bomb Factory, you name it. They're great plugins. They're just different. This reminds me of a vintage Fairchild when I've had the chance to use one. Pretty much if I ever visit another studio and there's a Fairchild, it's going on something. So this reminds me, this particular plugin reminds me of those Fairchilds. They're all a little different. None of them are the same. Um, they all have their little weird you know, uh, quirks. But I would say that the one they modeled this after was probably a particularly good Fairchild. So it sounds really great. So let's do this again. I'm just going to solo this same loop, but with no context, no uh, other instruments. I'm going to bypass the Fairchild just to let you hear really how different it is with it off. Pretty crazy. Sounds like a couple of, you know, samples. And yeah, sure, like the drums do get a little smaller with the Fairchild because it really uh, cramps down on that low end and squeezes it through. But that's kind of why they got used a lot on, on Beatle records is because they were able to really punch the drums through. So I'm going to do, a, a again, I'm going to do a bypass uh, as, we're, as we're playing back. The cool thing about it is, even if it does cut off some of that top of the transient, the reason why the Fairchild, I think, is so popular is like, in the mix, it really punches through. So check this out. I'm compressing like, I don't know, 5, 6 dB. And you can really still hear the the pillowy punch of the kick drum punches through everything and you know it's there and it's a great sound um drums are just one of the many uses that the fairchild 660 670 uh is great on you can use it on anything i, I think i have a piano as well i pass Back in. Mm -hmm. 
me not playing the piano so well. It just makes mixes punchy. I'll show you one thing on this. Let's go to the master bus. I'll show you something really cool about this particular plugin. So we're going to go to the 670, not the 660. And let's put it on the master bus. I don't know. Let's put it on five or six. This is kind of like an auto uh, release. We'll match our gains. You can hear it's really grabbing it. But I'm going to show you something pretty cool that that this has that Fairchilds do not have in general. So I, I guarantee you that all most of what is grabbing uh, the gain reduction here in the detector is the low end. So you know you usually don't. I wouldn't say that people use Fairchilds on mix buses, at least not often, because they can really just be really grabby. And what the side chain allows you to do is um, you have a side chain all the way up to 500 hertz. So check this out. Let's put it at, what is this, probably 250. That should be clear of most, uh, you know, low end things that are grabbing it. Drop. So it really grabs a lot of that low end when you when you don't use the side chain. In the event that you do use this on a mix bus, that's it, it turns it into a much more versatile uh, compressor. And then also, like if you want to just kind of cram it and do this, no side chain. Let's go down to like the fastest release time. Let's turn the threshold way up, the input way up, and just kind of smash the hell out of the mix, right? got a mix knob which is uh pretty much these days in recording if you don't have a, a wet dry on a plug-in people get a little upset because it's just expected now i think and what is that that's basically parallel compression it's something people have been doing for years but now instead of having to duplicate tracks and have a dry and a wet that they've found out a way to uh do dry wet within the own plug-in so again for things like a mix bus or even a drum bus that you really want to hit hard and maybe you don't want the entire drum bus to crumble, but you still like some of the distortion that the heavy compression creates, this mix knob is fantastic for that. See, I'm compressing at 10 dB, but I'm, my mix knob's at 50, and it sounds pretty great still. So. Just kind of add some life and excitement to the mix. Um, you know, I usually use something quicker like a SSL or some other sort of compression for my mix bus that, that glues stuff together. But after hearing this, it's it's nice to hear that punch. It really does bring the punch forward and they're incredible compressors. All right, so another plug-in that I really love that I use a lot that is actually Beatles related is the Waves J37. And at the moment, I'm using it for delay uh, as kind of a, a 60s, which is what, you know, in the 60s, they would have probably at Abbey Road, if we were talking about this being an Abbey Road, it's great that they added the delay feature to this, but they would usually use the smaller two-track machines for their delays. Um, but it, it's all in all very similar. They were all tube uh, tape machines and really substantial in their uh, girth and uh, just how how big they sounded overall. The muse was rather sad, I just had to let it's great. It reminds me of every tape delay I've ever used, like a real one. Like you get that real kind of high pitched feedback when it when it gets oversaturated and also just harmonically these are incredible you have three different tape formulas you have the 888 the 811 the 815 uh 888 was seen very early in the abbey road days 811 was what we would see in the 60s with uh you know all your favorite 
groups that would use Abbey Road. And then 815 came a little later. All in all, some of the best tape formulas ever made. And they've emulated them here somehow. And uh, they're really fun. And, you know, I think some of these, especially at different speeds, I know that some of these tapes, like if you go down to 15 eps, I know that you can, if you look to the right, uh, seven and a half eps, if you look to the right, like the 815 will allow you to to go to plus three or plus five on your, your bias. Eight, eight, triple eight, eight, eleven didn't. So it's likely that because these were earlier tapes that, that these tapes were not as loud as, say, the 815 formula. Which makes sense because as tape would progress in its development over time, they learned how to manufacture louder tape. What does louder tape mean? That means that the tape itself would allow you to hit it harder and be able to uh, deal with it without falling apart. Not falling apart physically, but falling apart in, in like a you know, an audible way. A lot of people will say, if you ask producers, what was your favorite tape formula? You know, a lot of people like uh, the 3M that, because that was one of the, the first loud tapes. That was a plus nine tape. So similar here. So the 815 is going to be a louder tape, but these oh, no. really cool thing. Let's turn the delay off. I'll just let you hear. We're going to go over here just to the vocal. So I also have it on the vocal for, not for delay, but oh, no. So, what we'll do here is I'm just going to show you. Great distortion. And if we've switched between the tape formulas, the tape, the, the distortion changes. So. So you hear how it's louder on the 811? That's because I think it's a quieter tape, so you're going to get more saturation out of it. With the 888 being the earliest formula, having kind of the most saturation. I use this a lot with instruments that don't get hit by tape when I record albums. So if I'm, I'm doing a record and we have lots of you know synths or anything that, that doesn't really touch tape or... If I'm not doing a tape record, then I really love to use tape emulation plugins to kind of soften transients because digital can be really literal. It can be really in your face and really harsh sometimes. And, and, and this allows you to, to kind of shave off some of the, the harshness and the edges of things, which is really what tape does in general. So I love this plugin for that. Another really cool thing that, oh, no. that you can mess with that's not probably as cool in a vocal, but the wow and flutter is pretty great. Oh, no. the news was rather sad. <laughs> you can get wild. Oh, no. the news was rather sad. Well, I just had to laugh. Like the, here's the flutter. I saw the photograph. Although the news was rather sad. They're both kind of like tremolo. They're kind of like a tremolo and a vibrato, but but they're done after, uh, you know, actual tape flutter, wow and flutter, which is something that if you have a, a high level of, high in, of wow and flutter on your tape machine, you need to call your tech. It's not something you want because then it creates a lot of issues. Um, with recording and playback. Let me show you again, just on the kind of the distortion side, what these biases will do. So, you know, we'll go to the 811, which, which I dig, and let's hit it. Let's try this. people turn to stand. Didn't notice that the lights had changed. Didn't notice that. Let's try the bias at plus three. He didn't notice that the lights had changed. Plus five. He didn't notice that the lights had changed. So at plus five, what's happening is you're getting a higher record level on the bias. So it's not going to distort as much as it might down at, at what this was probably zero dB. So he didn't notice that the lights had changed. He didn't notice that the lights had changed. Another cool way to use this would be on like a drum bus as well, just to, so I'm going to dry this drum bus up, no fair child. 
and just show you how how this thing can crush anything in a cool way. Uh, we'll go bypass. Great, great distortion, and what gets really fun with a seven and a half. I go down to like this this model. It gets even crunchier. Then you can also mess with the saturation and you wanna You can even mess with That's pretty cool with a wild and flutter. I mean that that's a great, you know make a loop out of that and put it at the top of the song. Um, but the delay is also great as well as I was saying earlier, but you can. You can mess with the uh, high pass, low pass. You can do a slap or you can do a feedback, which is, uh, which what happens is the, this knob instead of uh, delay level ends up becoming your feedback knob. It's great. I love it. I love the J37. Okay, this is another one of my favorite plugins that I use in general. I also have one. I have a, a hardware version of this. This is the RS124, which is uh, a pretty crazy um, very mu compressor that was originally an all tech 436B and at Abbey Road they modified them and uh, changed some things. I believe they changed a couple transformers and then they added uh, a recovery and a hold mechanism, which this has auto hold, which is not quite the same as the originals, but probably more useful. There's studio and cutter, you know, I guess the cutter is the depressed version. Uh, but the studio version, I think, generally has a, a faster attack. And the cutter version, which is referring to the cutting room at Abbey Road, they had a pair of Altex that were modified uh, to cut to vinyl, so uh, or cut to the lathe. So you'll notice it when I play this back. So let's just listen to this, these drums bypass, and I'm gonna start playing with this guy. It's really fun. And then we got Superfuse, which is kind of like speeds everything up and then messes with the threshold. And these, we also have wet dry. Then we have the roll off, which I like. I have a, a, a RS124 made by Chandler Limited that I, I love. It's my one of my favorite things in the whole world. And to me, it sounds like this high end roll off is more accurate to my unit, uh, at least. Out of super fuse, not as crazy. Superfuse, you can really go for it. You also got the mix knob, which is nice again. Everything's got to have a mix knob. Uh, and I'll show you the cutter side, which the attack is less. I actually really like, my probably my favorite way to use this in many uh, settings is 
is in superfuse mode, but with the cutter attack, which is a little slow. It's almost a little more like the Fairchild uh, in that in that mo in that attack setting. In the cutter. Then you can get really fun with it, and and you know right now we've got a stereo side chain, so we're we're pulling these things both with the same horses. So if we go to duo, what we're going to end up having is is probably a left heavy compression here. I actually think it's cooler because when you go to duo. It allows that snare to breathe. See so here when you when you go to stereo, it kind of pulls the snare off to the side, but duo it allows it to breathe. Then of course you got mid side, which you know. That's pretty trippy. It's a really, really cool compressor. Okay, I want to show you guys something that I use a lot, and I read a lot of comments on YouTube and Instagram of people dismissing this plugin, saying that it's a lazy man, like that's it's a lazy plugin because it there's something wrong with your mix. I think that's that is not true, and the plugin is Soothe, and I know a lot of guys that use this, um, and it's an incredible plugin, and. I mostly use it for drums. I don't really put it on mixes that much. A lot of times as mixers, we don't have the pleasure of recording our own drums. And sometimes you get tracks that are not very close to something that you would have done. And, and I, I would say that a lot of times I end up, when I get a treatment that I like on the drums, uh, because I didn't record it, or maybe because it was they were using mics that I wouldn't have chosen for that particular uh, treatment. Uh, you can get into trouble with with harshness, and I call Soothe my my symbol killer. These drums are sound pretty great, actually. So I'm not I'm not too worried about them, but um, but I'm just going to show you how it works and how I like to use it. And I've even got a decapitator on on the drums here, so I, I, I'm definitely adding some harshness with that distortion. Let's just really compress these guys. I'm going to make the drums purposefully harsh. So there's a lot of that kind of high mid going on. Let's put this, let's put Soothe on and see what happens. Now there's a preset I like, but I but I I tend to move it around quite a bit. The mat symbols, but I find I need to make them uh, a preset that I like. I find that the symbols that bother me are not up here. I find that they're down here. Um, Even just that, as simple as that, this is a this is a preset. The ultra and sampling, I uh, usually depending on what the session is, we're at 44 one, so I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mess with oversample. If we were at 96, I'd probably do four times. Um, resolution, ultra, offline, same. That's probably I don't know why they put that there, because if you're doing an offline bounce, you, you should Definitely expect for your oversample and your resolution to not change unless there's some reason, possibly. Uh, hard works well. The soft is is fine, but I feel like hard can handle uh, drums a lot better. Also, the sharpness of the reduction. I I, I like to do. I like to keep. Uh, it, it works well sharp on drums. If you go. If you go too, you know, too far back, that starts to really 
it, re it really starts, you can see the waveforms, it really starts to grab at stuff that you don't necessarily want to reduce. Sharp. Sharp's a very finite, very particular set of frequencies. Uh, since selectivity, same kind of thing. So that selectivity is going to be based on transients. And, uh, you know, if you turn your selectivity down again, it, it gets less uh, detailed. I like the selectivity up because I think if you already have a drum sound that you really like, that what the selectivity does is it, is it, is it tries to keep up and, and it will reduce those problem frequencies with the least invasive means. So it's going to be a lot easier to, you know, go back and forth and say, oh, you know, oh man, like the, uh, the crack of the snare is gone. Or um, I think that the selectivity really, the whole pr point of that is to, to kind of avoid those types of issues. Then we have depth mix as well. You know, you can also go like this and You start to get little boogers in there when you go that far. So I, I, I don't really go that far with depth. I, I, I try and keep it back here and and I, I don't want to reduce a lot like it's just really that the snares not bother me. It's just that the, the ride really gets, you know, very nasally. And it, it really does sit in this kind of two to four K range. And sometimes it peaks at four or five, but a lot of times I find when I start to compress stuff, what really uh, starts to show up are, are, are mid-range issues. So um, I love this plugin. I definitely use it for that kind of thing. Uh, I use it more often than not on stuff that I don't record just because I try and uh, record things with the mix in mind that I know what I'm, I'm going to do ahead of time. So... You know, if, if, if I know I'm going to really compress some drums uh, in the mix, then I, I might go for some softer overheads like Coles or, you know, 67s as opposed to C12s maybe. The tack and release, self-explanatory. You can do MS with this, which is really cool. Probably not too helpful on a drum mix, but definitely helpful if you end up putting this on uh, your mix bus, which I don't do much, uh, not often at all. Um, if you find yourself doing that, maybe go do a little, little bit of detective work. But but sometimes it's the answer. Sometimes you love your mix so much that you just want to reduce a little bit of harshness somewhere before you send it off. And and I think that Soothe 2 is a great plug-in for that purpose. I'm featuring in this part of the video some friends of mine, Abley House. If, you, if you're a Beatles fan and you don't know Abley House and you're watching this on YouTube right now, open a new window and subscribe to their channel. They do the best Beatle part recreations of anyone ever. They nail it. The plugin that I want to show is the fantastic Abbey Road Chamber. And this thing, I use this a lot. And no, not just for Beatles stuff. I use it on records. I use it a lot on drums. I use it like as a, a snare plate or, or even just like a kind of like a room mic because what is it? It's a room, it's a chamber. So it works really well for that kind of stuff, um, especially with shorter time. The 1.5 is uh, longer. It's still not quite as long as the original chambers at Abbey Road, but it's what I use. It's my setting. Um, it's pretty much... Uh, I, I tweak these by ear, but um, I'm just going to let it speak for itself. But I'm going to let you hear some of this, and we're going to solo a couple vocals, and we're going to listen to uh, this chamber. Pretty great right these guys these guys are so good it's insane um i'm gonna pull the chamber up we're just gonna listen a little bit oh, no, oh, please. so these were done live so they stood in the room and were it was a u48 and figure eight and they stood on either side of the mic and they sang and they played live 
and we overdubbed the hand claps, but just listen to the tail of this chamber. It's so great. You let me be your man. And please say to me, you let me hold your hand. You can hear that little delay, kind of. Hold your hand. So part of that is this feedback so we have a pretty big pre-delay, 120 milliseconds. And that was typical for these chambers because these chambers were notoriously short. Most of them weren't longer than a second, second and a half maybe, um, because they weren't very big rooms. They were, you know, medium-sized kind of storage rooms that were in the basement of Abbey Road. And one of them was on the roof. I think the, I think the Studio One or the Studio Three chamber was on the roof at one point. They would funnel a, a signal down to the chamber, and a lot of times, many times, they would actually record it. You can see the setup here. You got an Alltech speaker, and you got a couple KM53s, and the sewer pipe that was stuck around the room to kind of create some diffusion and some disbursement of the echo so that it wasn't, you know, too bathroomy. Generally, this longer pre-delay is is how to get uh, a longer reverb on these recordings and, and being able to be subtle with it is also super important you know when you have a super long reverb you can get away with putting it up in your face but when you have a much shorter reverb you'll really hear that pre-delay so you're going to be able to sneak it in the filters to the chamber so this basically this is the 60s setting and i think maybe even it was down a little more for the high end but they cut the bass all the way up to 600. you know they were adding high mids as well oh, yeah. It's not long, but it sounds long. That's kind of the trick with these. You can change the position, room. Hold your hand. Hold your hand. Wall, classic. Hold your hand. Classic seems to give you the longest tail, uh, but I mess around with it all the time. The speakers, you can change. You know, the Altex are really mid-rangey. You can go to the B&Ws, uh, which are much more hi-fi. And see, it's a bit rounder. It's not as mid-rangey. It doesn't cut through as well, but it's great. You know, on more modern stuff, I use the B&Ws. You can also go to the MK2Hs, which are definitely a more modern mic than the KM53. Oh, yeah. they're, they're smoother. And, you know, so if you combine that with the B&Ws, then this is probably a more modern sounding setup. Oh, yeah. And then if we do this, let's roll this all the way back down to even like 150 and let's roll this up to, to flat. Oh, yeah. It's more natural sounding. It's more natural sounding, kind of more modern sounding reverb now. Uh, so they're really versatile though. Oh, yeah. and when I touch you, I feel happy. You can really hear it work there, but I'm gonna pull these back to 10 and six. Uh, turn this back to all tech and this back to 53. Pretty crazy, right? Check this out with that, just, just so you can hear it without the vocals. It's pretty wild. Still get a little bit of chamber in there as well. It's one of my favorite plugins ever. I, I was so happy when they released. You can really hear that pre delay now. Man, Tyson and Neil, incredible vocals. That was all live. That was two of them on a mic. I love the chamber. I think you should use it every chance you get. Try it on, try it on a drum bus, like 
just even the whole bus and and mess with your top and your bass cuts and 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 get a sound you like get something more in the mid-range it's a great way to emulate a room and uh along with i have a real emt 140 uh i would say that between this and the uad 140 the chamber gets used a lot and so does the uh, uad capital chambers it's one of the best sounding uh chamber plugins ever made and it's kind of untouchable when it comes to the just the depth of how they've gone into the depth of each chamber and different microphones and you know resonant frequencies that being said i find it that much quicker to get a sound from the abbey road chambers just because it's a bit simpler to use and also because um it's shorter and you're kind of limited by its uh its length so it makes you work a little harder to get a good sound out of it and i think that if you work a little harder to get a good sound out of a shorter chamber with your pre-delay with your top and your bass cuts that the subtleties of of that effort are going to find them they're they're going to find themselves into your mix they're going to find their way into your mix and i think that um, you're going to make better mixes if you try to work with these plugins and not just go for something that that looks easy you know get into them explore them do something completely weird that you shouldn't do with them you know play with the steed the, the steed's really fun what happens here is we get we get into delay lands It's a great sound, but it was used at, at some some Beatles uh, recordings. They did use this, and I'm pretty sure Pink Floyd as well. What it is, all it is, is, is the pre-delayed tape machine that was being sent to the chamber before it was recorded back. You got your reverb volume. You got your dry wet. Of course, you got to have that. This is, I think, an RS-127. Yeah, RS-127 uh, EQ, which they had uh, filtered to the chamber. So you can also... You know, without the pre-delay, just check this out for a second. No filter, no pre-delay. A little bit underwhelming, right? I had to turn it up. Filter, steed, let's see how this goes. So it really kind of puts it into orbit. Incredible tools. If you are using this plugin, you cannot neglect these controls because they are very much a big part of how to get a great sound. And this is not, you know, they didn't make this thing like some of the uh, IR modeling reverbs where you can give yourself infinite decay. They limited it, I think, pretty well to how the original was. Except if you changed microphones and speakers, it would probably take an hour to get an assistant to go down there and do it. So luckily you don't have to wait an hour to do that with the plug-in. Pretty great. It puts you in the position of how some of the engineers at Abbey Road were put in position of saying, well, we don't have a plate reverb, but we have these little rooms with tiles in them. And they're really short. And they're not saying much. How do we get more out of them? Let's add a tape delay before and put a super long tape delay and see what happens let's put an eq on that is sending to the chamber let's put a top cut a bass cut and they got really creative in how they made these chambers really work until they did eventually get plates but it's a known fact that the abbey road chambers were a favorite for a lot of people for a very long time and uh you know sadly the years ago i believe in the 80s the this chamber which was the abbey road 2 chamber uh, got flooded and the room just kind of fell into disrepair and was rotting and uh they built it back for george martin in the early 90s when they did the beatles anthology but it was never quite the same and it was a bit shorter as well than it originally was but i think they've done a good job at, at uh being able to uh deal with that and make it still very usable and it's one of my favorite plugins thank you everyone for watching i hope you enjoyed i hope you learned something and i hope you maybe buy some plugins that you don't have maybe i inspired you to 
And I also would love to tell you to go over to Pro Mix Academy and check out the Let It Be class that we did recording how the Beatles recorded at Savile Row at Apple Records with the same microphones, the same instruments, the same guitar amps, the same drums. And for some of it, we had the same front end of the console. We had the red 47 preamps, which is what Glenn Johns was using. The course is really fun, and it's one of my favorite things I've ever done. It's one of my favorite experiences I've ever had in the studio. Being able to play with other people and, and hear those sounds back was incredible. I monitor this channel, so if you have questions, please comment below. I'll be happy to answer the best I can. Thanks. Mm -hmm.